Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, my name is, uh, wow, that's loud. Usually I'm loud without these things. Okay, fair enough. Uh, my name is Maddie Stratton. I'm a DevOps evangelist at PagerDuty, and I come from Chicago. I help run DevOps days and stuff like that. And usually, um, this next slide would be the one when I'm going to basically give you my resume and tell you why you should listen to me because I do a podcast and I've been doing this so long and blah, 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 blah. And I kind of realized that's kind of arrogant. So instead, I just have some pictures of my kids to get you on my side. <laughs> so these are cute kids. So obviously, I you know what I'm talking about. So <laughs> why do we care about this idea of making ops humane? Right? You may have said a lot of times we're talking about making our systems humane and the responsibility that goes along with that. It's something that's happening with a lot of the stuff with the Google duplex, right? When we're building things, what's the responsibility towards society? I'm going to distill this down a little bit smaller and talk about the responsibility that you might have within your organization. So when we talk about operations, we have people that are running those operations for us, right? And we want to make sure that their experience of doing that, because they're helping support the applications that we build, these are, as humane ops would imply, those are humans on the other end of that. So a couple things to, to, to think about. So I went out there, and anytime I do a talk and I can't think of a couple slides I need to do, I just ask Twitter for some ideas. So I asked, I tweeted, and I said, how would you describe on-call in your organization in three words? And as for the on-call situation, we had, this is fine. You did what? Please mute yourself. Call everyone. Works in dev. Scotch, 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 and a dumpster fire. So these were the more positive responses that I got. So those of you who have been on call or, or have that experience understand that it's generally not the kind of thing that we love. I work for a company called PagerDuty. We're a company that people love to hate. They love to hate us because they love the product. They hate what it does. What it does usually is wake people up in the middle of the night when what I want to be doing is sleeping. Now, when there's really something wrong, yes, you do have to be woken up in the middle of the night sometimes. Yes, sometimes our weekends are interrupted. Yes, sometimes we might be wanting to play Call of Duty or something, and instead we actually have to do our job. These things occur. I've spent most of my career before I became a hand-waving evangelist working in operations, so I'm used to it. But just because that's the way that it's always been does not mean that's the way it always has to continue to be. And things are getting worse. Now, we did a little bit of uh, information gathering at PagerDuty. We commissioned a, a study. Uh, we, we did one across 10,000 companies, over 100 different kinds of organizations, different verticals, different sizes, small, medium, large businesses. And so this was, uh, we surveyed 50,000 responders, and they received a total of 760 million notifications. So we looked at some of the different kind of data about this. Oh, it gets better. Um, so what we saw is that 60 million of them occurred during dinner hours. 82 million occurred during evening hours. 250 million were during sleeping hours. And 122 million notifications on weekends, which is a total of three quarter million nights with sleep interrupting notifications. What we found is that there are certain parameters that are most likely to make people leave your organization if they are a responder. And there's a little bit of a hint in here, because we had a total of 330,000 weekend days with interrupt notifications. This is not a pleasant way to live your life. This is not what we call work-life balance. Because one of the other things that's true about this information is that these almost, none of the, not none of these, but all of these are not necessary. So here's what we found. When we looked at and we interviewed responders who left their, their employer, and we said, why are you most likely to stay for 18 months or longer? We found three categories that said these were the things that made the biggest difference. You can probably guess what they are based upon the numbers I just showed you. The number of days were in a, in a certain span when a responder's workday was interrupted. So if there's too many of those days, that's the kind of thing that makes people start looking for another job. Too many uh, being woken up overnight, and then actually the most was the number of weekend days interrupted by a notification. Now, a lot of us work for companies that are 24-7 companies. These things happen, right? Things are going to happen in the middle of the night. Things are going to happen over the weekend. What the scenario was, it wasn't saying that being woken up in the middle of the night, period, makes me want to leave my job. What means is too many times. Too many times my weekend's interrupted. Too many times my workday is interrupted. 
Because con workday interruptions are a challenge because context switching is a total thing, right? What do I mean by that? How many times you're working on something, someone comes and interrupts you? It takes you between 15 and 45 minutes to get back to the level of productivity you were at before the person came over and said, yo, what's up? And that's as much as they have to do is interrupt you. They don't have to talk to you for an hour. They just have to stop your train of thought. So if you're in an interrupt-driven type of role, like operations, this is happening to you all the time. This is what contributes to burnout. So we want to make this better. Now the point of this talk is to say, OK, not to say why it's important. I think most of us probably would say, yes, it's important to treat our colleagues humanely, like they're humans. Most of them, at least, you probably could all think of a couple of colleagues that maybe you wouldn't classify as humans, don't deserve to be treated humanely. But in general, let's treat them well. So I don't think you need me to tell you that making on-call better for your colleagues is something we should do. And if you did, then I just told you that. So great, now we're all caught up. The problem is when I have these conversations with people, oftentimes they say to me, well, Maddie, that's cool, but I'm not the CIO. I'm not a senior manager. I don't, I'm not the director of infrastructure. I'm an individual contributor. So I don't get to change how things work, right? So yeah, I'd like to make things better, but I, I can't change things. So my idea here is to talk a little bit about how change can be made in this particular arena, no matter where you sit in the organization, and how that actually gets accomplished. So first of all, we're going to talk about the term meme. Now memes can mean something like this, which is the things we usually know about, and they usually show up in my talks, right, where it's uh, something with impact, impact font over some kind of a joke. This is Richard Dawkins. So Richard Dawkins talked about in a book called The Lazy Gene, he said that you know, some examples of memes are things like tunes or ideas or catchphrases, and they get moved from person to person, similar to how genetics moves from body to body. And this is how, this is a manner in which we evolve, right? We continue to evolve from generation to generation through the, through the conversation that happens through memes. And this has happened over the history of humankind, right? So what we're going to talk about a little bit is that this can happen in your organization. You can create a meme. And I don't mean a meme that's got Sean Bean on it that says chef is coming because they're going to start doing automation or something like that. But the meme of how maybe your individual team, your small squad, your particular part of doing work can have success and you can start to have those ideas jump from team to team. And literally, as the title of this talk implies, infect your organization. We mean that in a good way. It's a good kind of infection. I don't know anyone in real life that's like that, but we're going to pretend. So. I also talk a little bit about, there's a, a popular science fiction book called Snow Crash. How many people have read the book Snow Crash? Okay. So this is a popular cyberpunk book. And there's some ideas around memes um, being transmitted from hackers to hackers within it. Hackers in the uh, not stealing things idea, but computer hackers, people that are programming. So remember, again, memes are another way of evolving across generations. This happens in the book Snow Crash but it happens in an organization. So in Snow Crash, there was something called Snow Crash that itself was a neuro-linguistic virus that was transmitted from individual to individual just by looking at bitmaps. And so the bad guys figure out how to unlock this within the human brain, and then they spread it from hacker to hacker like a meme, right? Um, there's also lots of cool swordplay. This is a really cool book. And so the thing is, so Neil Stevenson's the, the creator then, he says, ideology is a virus. So we're talking about an ideology, a way that we're thinking about doing work. It's a virus that we're going to spread within our organization. So I'll talk about a couple of things. So I said, hey, you said, hey, Maddie, I'm not the big boss. What can I do? So first we're going to talk about, let's say you are. Let's say you are the big boss. You don't get off scot-free. This talk isn't just for individual contributors. So I don't know if anybody here is senior management or aspires to be, but if you are, listen up, because this is what you can do. So some of the things is, remember, command and control doesn't work. Tattoo this on your eyelids. Command and control doesn't even work in the military. They stopped doing this years ago. So the idea of just sitting and saying, this is how we're going to do it and follow along is never going to work. So if the idea is, as, as the supreme leader, you know, some, someone on the ELT says, we're going to go humane up all the ops. We're going to make our on-call better. So we're going to just do that. It's not going to change a damn thing, right? So what we need to do is think about what we are able to. When you're at that level, it's a lot more challenging to direct change that's around specific action. What you can do is you can guide towards objectives and towards outcomes. So some of those things are, bear in mind, to use measurement for good, not for evil. 
I'll give you an example of why this can matter. So we have an offering at PagerDuty where we help measure your operational health, right? And one of those things is we look at it and we say, you know what, if responders are replying to pages slower than they usually do, they're probably getting burned out. So that means your people are getting unhealthy. So we should do something about that. Who can think of a way that that same information could be used for evil? Hey, you're not responding to pages quickly enough. I'm putting you on a performance plan, right? So you gotta, bear, you gotta think about that. You can keep the same information that can help you understand the health of your organization can also be used to punish and penalize people. So bear, keep that in mind. Also, you wanna avoid the executive swoop. So how many people have ever been on a call, an incident call, and some C-level executive or some ELT person jumps on and immediately demands information and tells you everything that you're doing wrong, right? This is non-productive. So if you are an executive or aspire to be one and eventually do become one, do not do this. Chances are anything you've thought of has already been thought of and what you're doing, what are you doing? You're interrupting. What did we talk about happening? During interrupts, we become less effective and less efficient. So those are three things. If you are at the, the top echelon of your organization, doesn't matter how big it is, three ways that you can help make on-call more humane. Don't worry, as we go, we're gonna make this more applicable. Uh, think about if you're in what you might call middle management. I don't know if we still call it middle management, that might be kind of a Dilbert term anymore, but the point being, you're running a team, maybe a team of teams. So what are some of the things you can do when you, when you are in charge of part of the organization, right? So one thing is to encourage safe post-incident review spaces. So how many people have heard of something called a blameless post-mortem? Okay, good. If you haven't, Google it. It's a very important thing. As its name would imply, we're looking at things that happen after an incident and we're trying to decide what happened without pointing blame. Bear in mind that blameless does not mean lack of accountability, right? Blameless, you know, if somebody goes and they actually personally mess things up because they did something you know, malicious? Yes, the blameless postmortem doesn't mean, well, that was okay that you, you know, gave all our credit cards to like the Russians. It's like, no, you're gonna kind of be accountable for that. So what you wanna do in this, in a team like this, if you're running the team, is encourage the ability to have these safe spaces. And that safe space may mean that you don't get to participate in the post-incident review. Maybe you just see the outcome of it. So encourage that. Drive for a culture of learning. So a culture of learning is, is one where you might imply, as its name would say, the only impact of, of making a mistake is that you learn something. How many people have had the luxury of working on a team like that? How many people sure wish they did? It's amazing what you can get done if the impact of making a mistake is that you learn something. So as a manager, you can, you can drive for that particular culture. And the way you do that is don't fire people for making mistakes. You cannot fire your way to reliability. That's the lesson of the middle manager. And finally, think about this. You hired a bunch of smart people. Please use them. If you brought people into your team for their subject matter expertise, you need to let those people go and do what they're smart at and do what they're good at and follow along where their subject matter expertise happens. Your job as a manager is to communicate you can potentially be part of the communication channel that goes up to help prevent that executive swoop, maybe. Executive swoop, maybe. Um, you can also provide information back down into your team, but your job is not to tell your team what to do. Because I'll tell you something, how many people have been a manager before or are currently a manager? How effective is it to have a whole team when you have to tell them everything they have to do all the time? At that point, you haven't really accomplished much of anything. You're keeping yourself busy and fundamentally you have one brain that you're now directing a whole bunch of people. In fact, you are directing, you're not delegating. So use your smart people. If you don't have a bunch of smart people, then figure out your hiring problem. So let's talk about this. I said, let's have a culture of learning. What does this mean? So if we don't treat every outage or alert as something to learn from or something to improve, we run the risk of having something called normalization of deviance occurring, right? In this case, Normalization of deviance in our organization means that we start to accept alerts and degradations as acceptable. So that's not okay. This is sometimes we call this the broken window effect because we let our standards suffer. We let things slip through the cracks. So in a generative performance oriented organization, failure leads to inquiry. 
Say that one again, it's important. Failure should lead to inquiry. That doesn't mean the Spanish Inquisition. Doesn't mean that you make a mistake, you're put on trial. But it means there's a failure, we want to understand what caused that failure. Don't take my word on it, you can ask a gentleman named Ron Westrom, who's written about this topic. And I have a link about this at the end in my notes. I almost called it show notes. You can tell I do a podcast. And you could also ask Dr. Nicole Forsgren, who is here, and will lecture you much, much better than I ever will about Westrom and a, um, a culture of learning. So Nicole's speaking tomorrow about uh, a whole bunch of metrics and, and a lot of other really smart things, and you're lucky to have her. So we're going to think about that. Now, I promised that I would give you some suggestions on things you could do if you're an individual contributor. Right? So how many people here consider themselves an individual contributor who does not participate in on-call? Okay, how many people are individual contributors? You're going to all end up raising your hand at some point. So. And how many people are individual contributors who are on call? Okay, so a lot of us are, but a lot of us aren't. So these are the ways, these are some of the things that we can do to make on call better. Now even, I want to think about this, those of you who raised your hand and said I'm on call, I'm an individual contributor, this still can apply to you, it just might be ways that you can help make on call better for your colleagues that maybe aren't part of your team. Or maybe are part of your team, maybe just aren't you. So this is the meat of it. This is the stuff where you're not the big boss, you can't set strategy. You don't go there and set a three-year plan for how you're going to DevOps all the things. But we're going to actually take some actionable things so that our colleagues don't decide they want to up and quit because they're getting interrupted 300,000 times a year over the weekends. Also, if you are one of those big, big bosses who's doing all the strategy and everything, the average cost to replace a software engineer nationwide is $350,000. So even if you don't want to do this out of the goodness of your heart, some point or another, it's hitting your bottom line. Burnout is a thing. So what are some of the things we can do? We can review all the things. So Andy Fleener, who runs platform operations at Sports Engine, he told me when I was asking, what are the things that you do to make things better? He said they review every single alert from the last 24 hours or every weekend every day. It's part of their early morning, right? Their morning meeting starts with, let's look at what those alerts were. And he said, no broken windows. No broken windows as in we don't allow those alerts. And does it mean that they just say, yep, we sure did have some alerts. Now we know what they are. Let's go on with the rest of our day. They look and say, were these actionable? If they were not actionable, then we need to do something with our monitor, right? Are we being alerted on things that don't matter? And the way we know that is by reviewing. And it only helps us to review if we're doing it consistently. We can't decide that, well, we have some time, sometimes during our team meetings, so let's pull up Nagios and take a look at what alerts looked like over the last week. This needs to be part of your discipline um, because it becomes muscle memory. It just becomes a thing that you do. And when you first start doing it, I'm going to tell you something. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be really, really unpleasant because you're going to have lots of them. You're going to have lots and lots of noise. But you know one of the things that we like to say in DevOps, especially when we talk about automation, if something hurts, you do it more often, right? And the reason for that is it makes us make it hurt less. So reviewing all of our alerts hurts. Do it every day. They will go down. Um, we talked about normalization of deviance. So how can we affect normalization? Normalization of deviance says that when we allow little things to go through, Big things come through as well because we lower our standards. We all do this. Every organization, it's hard not to. There's just too much stuff. So this is the, that gradual process by which our standards drip, right? What starts out as an unacceptable practice becomes okay. So, and then it becomes repeated and you don't have catastrophic results. You have this thing where you're like, ooh, if we do this thing, then, then it's going to be awful. And then you're like, hey, you know what? Production didn't go down because we, you know, we didn't delete the temp files and, and we're still okay. So I guess that's not important. We can let that go. And these things slowly happen over time. And it becomes the social norm. This happened to NASA twice. This is what happened with both space shuttle accidents were because of normalization of deviance, because of small things that became the standard. And those are catastrophic results. 
Hopefully within your IT organization, you're not gonna have catastrophic results of that nature, but it's still the same thing. So don't feel bad, this happened to NASA twice. And in our case, what this means is we start to accept alerts and degradations as okay. How many of you had that thing where you get this page, you get this alert, and you're like, oh, but that's no big deal, that just happens, right? Did this all the time. I had, when I worked at apartments.com, we had our backend database cluster, and I could tell when it was being backed up every night because the CPU would go high, which means that the, that the monitor would go off, and I would get paged, you'd, you'd get this page at one in the morning which was my way of knowing that it was one in the morning because ADB zero was not responding. Okay, so that becomes, you know, that's a normalization. We're like, it's fine, it's probably fine. Well, what happens when it's not? What happens when it's 1 a.m. and the thing is actually down? We're gonna completely disregard it. And even worse, we're gonna start to disregard and not trust our monitoring because it's too noisy. So, these metrics we talked about, and I wanna talk real quick before I talk about the metrics. So when you talked about normalization of deviance, what that means is it's not okay. Don't let it be okay. And you have more power than you think you do. A lot of times in these scenarios like this, I give these suggestions, everyone says, that's real easy for you. You're the evangelist, you're standing up on stage going, do all these things, do all these things. I actually work for a living and I have people that don't listen to me. People will listen to you when you back it with data, when you back it with information. Uh, I'll tell you a story. Again, a lot of my stories about operations have gone horribly, horribly wrong had to do with when I worked at apartments.com. It was a different regime, a different time, so it's safe. It was pre-Jeff Goldblum ads, so don't worry about it. So we had a scenario wherein um, one of our web services was throwing 14,000 errors a minute. They were not real errors. That was just flooding the log. And uh, one of the sysadmins on my team who was responsible for that particular service, needless to say, was not pleased and continued to go to the business owner and the product owner and say, we need to spend some time in this sprint, we need to do something about it. But it was never given any kind of context. So this, tech, this story never made it into the sprint because it was always about the technology problem and it was, well, we're getting these errors and the log is getting flooded and blah, blah, blah. And at no point was it ever explained that because this happens, if something goes wrong, we won't know. And that was the thing, when, when I, I coached, he went and he said that to the product owner and it got fixed in the next story, the next sprint, because it was context. So you need to, a lot of times we understand why a change has to occur, because we've already gotten there. So we have to learn how to tell the story. So my point is, don't allow this normalization of deviance. And as Pete kind of mentioned a little bit earlier in um, in his talk, when, he, when someone asked a question, said, hey, dev is too busy, security is too busy, well, then your organization is sending a net message that says then security is not important. Well, you're getting a message that says reliability is not important. So at that point, what you need to do is you need to back the monitors off and say, then that's okay. If it's not important for us to invest the time in here, then this service is not that important. But what we can't have is we can't have this unreliability because it's actually considered harmful because incorrect information is worse than no information. So along those lines, let's talk about questioning metrics, since we're gonna talk about being bold. <laughs> so we're gonna make sure that we're setting the proper expectations. I, I asked the question once about you know, how you can make on-call better, and I had a salesperson, uh, not at PagerDuty, unfortunately. Uh, I wish he did, he was uh, someone I worked with at Chef. And he said one of the things he does as a salesperson is sets expectations with the customer. And that's an amazingly forward-thinking thing to do for someone outside of the technical part of your organization to do. But expectations are always higher than what's real, right? We always want the best of the best. Why not? I want 100% uptime. Sure, yeah, of course I need that. How fast does it have to be? Faster than last month, that's for sure. So we don't wanna just expect five nines of reliability because five is more than four. Why do we need five nines? Have we tied our, have the metrics been tied to a business outcome? There's another set of words to put into your vocabulary to get things done. Those two words are business and outcome. Anything we do, I'm sorry, I love technology. I love to be a nerd and I love to geek out, but if anything we do does not tie to a business outcome, then we should not be doing it. And unfortunately, that gets, that, that's easy when you talk about an application that might be tied to generating leads, might be tied to signups. We start to drift. Infrastructure folks have this really hard because we start to talk about things like, what about our DNS server? What about our backup systems? 
What about our email system? Well, first of all, stop running your own email anyway, because even Microsoft doesn't do that. But these things all need to tie to a business metric. And if you don't know what they are, ask the questions. And if you don't know how your business makes money, then stop doing everything else and go figure that one out. Because there's no way you can make the right decision as an IT professional if you don't know the way that your business makes money or provides value. Because again, you could be working for a nonprofit, you could be working for a company where the goal of the business is not to make money. But whatever it is that drives the business, why this organization you belong to exists, that's where your metrics come from. How do these metrics that you're measuring determine the success of your company or organization being able to do the thing that is why it exists? So, and also watch out for things like inaccurate extrapolation. So we might have some data that says, hey, you know what? If our page load time increases by a second, conversion drops by 50%. So I guess we need to make everything faster. Well, correlation and causation don't always equal each other, right? So we may move a number on one dial, not move somewhere else. So you gotta watch where your data is coming from. So again, why are we using these numbers? We wanna be able to ask these questions. What is the data that drives your incident process? An incident, by the way, is different than an alert. An alert can be something like, hey, we have excessive CPU on our database server. That's cool. It's not an incident, unless the goal of your company is to not use up all the CPU on your database server. But an incident is something like people cannot buy our product right now, or the user experience is degraded, or we're not able to bill our customers, or we're not able to send email. Those are incidents. We want to know what is the data and what is the system that drives an incident. And I got news for you, it's not a Nagios monitor. That can help, but too much CPU on your database server is not driving an incident. Are your metrics tied to business outcomes? So these things that we're measuring to decide if it's driving an incident or to decide if we're doing a good job, what's the business outcome that does that? If we're connected to a product, we should, our product owner should be able to tell us that or else they're not a very good product owner. And again, remember, correlation doesn't always equal causation. This happens a lot. We'll also, have you ever run into the scenario where you have an outage of some kind you go out there, this is not a bullet on here, but this is one that can be quite challenging and sometimes you just have to be able to, to, to deal with it, but this is my little on-call fun story. The fun thing that happens when you, uh, you sit there, you have an issue, you eventually resolve it, then you go back to your management and say, well, we figured it out, it was because of X. And the management says, why weren't you monitoring for X? And we say, well, because until right now, we didn't know that X was even a thing that could happen. So beware of this, your management, thinks you're magic. Use that wisely. And along those lines, that idea that management is thinking you're magic, sometimes we can make the mistake of believing that we are magic and that we can think of everything that ever might go wrong. So keep things simple. Do not over-design your systems. First of all, resume-driven development is almost always a recipe for on-call disasters, okay? If you're building something because you think it's cool, I guarantee the people who have to support it think you are the exact opposite of cool. They think a lot of really bad words about you that I can't say right now. So think about this, I invented a, a term for this. So I said that the more resiliency that a system is designed with, the more likely it is to cause a business impact. And I call that Stratton's Law of Catastrophic Predestination. So you can write that down. But why is this true? This isn't backed with data, this is just what I feel. But I've seen it to be true, and this is why. Because at the heart of every complex, resilient system is the hubris that someone believed they could predict everything that could go wrong. Fate and the internet are laughing at them. Now does this mean don't build redundancy into your systems? Does this mean don't try to make your systems resilient? Of course not. Because there are the things we know about. There are the things we can predict. But if we sit there and we say if we build this incredibly complex resilient system, we're totally safe, what we're doing is we've actually built a complex system. And the more complex it is, the more things that can go wrong. And the reason why I say that it's more likely to cause a business impact is we don't do this on stuff that's not important to the business. 
So we almost inherently find ourselves taking the most important thing to our company and making it the most brittle and the most complicated because it's so important. So keep things, make things as complex as they need to be, but no more than that. So let's think about a couple things that we can also do. Some of these sound really hard, like talk to people. Um, we can't put monitor, Agios monitors on people, but what does this mean when we're going to talk to people? So things like ask how the on-call is feeling during your stand-ups, right? Maybe those, those of you who aren't on-call, but maybe you've got a system engineer or an SRE or someone who joins it, ask them how they're doing. Ask them how on-call's going, right? Because this is really their opportunity. A lot of people are not going to come to you and tell you all the things you've done to make them get up in the middle of the night and why they hate you for it, unless you ask them. And even just asking makes it feel more humane. Because again, those of us who don't have to support these systems, because they do exist, and I know it would be nice if we all carried a pager, I'm not here to tell you that you need to do that. The on-call people don't work for you. They work with you. So we want to be colleagues, we want to work together with them. So these are things to think about when you're thinking about the people to talk to. Who are your customers? And those customers can be internal, they can be external. And what are their expectations? This goes back to those metrics because what you think the expectations should be may not match to what your customer needs. And I mean that in the case of you may be over delivering. Uh, how many people have read the Google SRE book? So there's, a, there's an example in there about a, a distributed system in there that, that's called Chubby. And what they did is they had a, an uptime requirement that they said it was X amount. I don't remember what it was. Let's say it was three nines. But what they found is that the system was actually fairly resilient. And it was up for a lot more than the minimum requirement. But what started to happen was people expected that system to be up more than what was the error budget they had done. So they actually intentionally take the system down to meet to that. So understand what those true requirements are. You don't have to get as aggressive about that, but it'll actually make your life a little easier. Whose customer are you, right? And then what's the, what's the uh, how can you help those particular folks that are servicing you, right? Maybe it's your corporate IT that's providing power and pipe, right? What's their on-call experience like? Talk to them, ask these questions. Because I'm gonna, okay, ask again, raise your hand if you, if you participate in on-call. Okay, keep your hand up if you would love for someone to ask how it's going sometimes, right? It'd be nice, nice to be considered. And then what are the perceptions of your team? There's the team that people know is responsive. There's the team that people know is always slow to reply. Kind of understand what people think about your team because that's gonna tell you a little bit about whether or not you need to adjust those expectations. So again, humans people are, right? At the end of the day, we're talking about people. And to make things better, we need to treat them as such. So a couple things, contextual on-call. What this means is that not every system at every time of day requires the same responsiveness. So think about something like maybe your general ledger system. Let's say you're a non-24-7 company. You work in the Midwest, you know, or whatever, you, you cross maybe two time zones, and you have a general ledger system. Well, you know what? During the day, that system probably needs to be notified, you probably need to be notified if it's down at any given time, because you need to be able to actually account. Well, if all the people that use that system go home at five o'clock and they don't show up till nine the next morning and nothing runs on it, don't be waking people up in the middle of the night if there's a problem with it. So think about the contextualness of the on-call, because there's, it's very, very frustrating to get notified with a non-actionable alert. Again, think about the golden rule. If you don't have to carry the pager, think about what it would have to be, what it would be like if you did. Think about if that thing is really important. And then also, bake cookies. So there's uh, Cookie Ops. This was a company that, uh, this was a Twitter account from a company that actually, that's what they did for their operations, folks. They sent them cookies. Cookies are great. Anybody who's doing something for you, Maybe they don't like cookies, maybe they like candy, but everybody chuckled, and the reason why, because we're people, right? They like stuff. So um, a couple other things you could do. So you could volunteer to help as an incident commander. Oh, what's an incident commander? I don't know, maybe we should have them. Maybe our, maybe our on-call could be done better. So think about this, within an organization, 
To participate in on-call, it does not mean that you have to be the subject matter expert in fixing the problem. In fact, according to a lot of good first responder techniques for on-call, the person running the incident should actually not be trying to solve the problem at all. At pager duty, we have an, an on-call rotation for incident command, and we explicitly allow anybody in the organization to be an incident commander, whether it's a product owner, it can be somebody in marketing, it can be an engineer, it can be an evangelist even. So this is something you could adopt in your organization, and it can really make things better because you're now part of this. So you might be sitting there and saying, you know what, I don't, I don't know how to solve these problems that happen after hours, but I'd like to be able to help. Working into some kind of incident command can help with that. So a couple things to think about if you're involved as an incident commander, or you may not call it that, maybe you're just running a bridge, maybe you're involved in that. So think about a couple pieces of that. You wanna have clearly defined roles during an incident. So it's not everybody just standing around trying to figure out what to do. Someone's gotta be running the call. Someone's gotta be saying, this is what so-and-so is gonna do. This is what Jimmy's gonna do. This is what Sally's gonna do. We're gonna keep track of it. We need to, if you're running the call, you need to avoid the bystander effect. Good example of the bystander effect. Can someone go look at the logs on the web server? Guess who someone is? Nobody, right? So the, the better way to handle that is you say, Jimmy, go look at the logs on the web server. I'm gonna check with you in five minutes and see if you've seen anything interesting there. We need to be explicit. And then rally fast, disband faster. So it is not pleasant to be on an after hours call. Nobody wants to be on that call. We need to get the right people in there as quickly as possible, but even more important, you need to get them off the phone as soon as you have what you need. Don't worry, you can get them back if you need them. It's incredibly frustrating to be sitting on a bridge with nothing to do while you're waiting for someone else to do work. Has anyone ever sat on a bridge of 100 or more people? How effective did you feel during that call? most of the time. On a scale of one to 10, it's probably about a negative two. And it's frustrating for the people that are doing the work because they know there's a bunch of people sitting there getting irritated at them, waiting for them to do that. How fun is it to work with someone looking over your shoulder? So rally fast, disband faster. You can get people back if you need them. And finally, don't litigate severity. Within your organization, you should know what defines what type of incident that exists. Remember we talked about that earlier, said understand what drives it. Because the last thing you wanna be doing when you're trying to solve a problem or you're trying to have people help you solve a problem is get into an argument about how important it is for that to be being done right now. You don't want that escalation to occur. You don't want it to be like, well, well we decided, you know, because sometimes you have a best effort. Sometimes it might be on a severity three, maybe we're gonna get on the bridge and we're gonna try to fix it for an hour and then we're gonna roll back. We need to already know that. We don't wanna be trying to figure it out while it's happening. So we said, don't litigate during a call. And then have a clear mechanism for making decisions. So that mechanism might be something like, you make a decision, you suggest to the incident commander, the person who's running the call, and they say, Sally suggests that we restart the, you know, restart Apache. Is there any strong objection? By the way, that's how we do it at PagerDuty. That's why I came to that really quickly. I'm gonna tell you how you can learn about that in a minute. But you wanna know how it works before you start. You need to have a clear way of making decisions. That actually makes things easier and less traumatic during a call. And also, share all the things. Um, this particular picture, I just decided I really like Rogue One. I didn't really have a lot to do with sharing. I was starting to think about because she was like stealing the plans. And, but when we're talking about sharing all the things, it's sharing all the tests. And I believe really strongly in this one. So bear in mind, tests are for software engineers, so SWE and SRE both. It's for dev, it's for ops, it's for everybody. Tests exist all, and they should be the same tests. All functional tests that you use in pre-production should have parity, should have an equivalent monitor in production. If you care, if this is your way of knowing that stuff works, you, you really wanna make sure it's still working in production, because who cares if it worked in pre-prod if it isn't working in prod. And likewise, if I'm monitoring something in production, there should be an equivalent test in pre-prod. And the way to think about this is that monitoring is nothing but testing with a time dimension. That's all we do when we monitor. Now again, we can start talking about observability and starting to understand troubleshooting. But we're not talking about that yet. We're just talking about pure monitoring. It's testing with a time dimension. There should be full parity between pre-production and production. 
Notice that I said functional. And we could get into a fight about what's a smoke test, what's a functional test. But things like unit tests, yes, I'm not going to put that into Nagios. I'm not testing a class. But is a system work? Yes or no, right? Is it performant? Yes or no. If I care about it enough to decide that this says it can be released, then I'm definitely checking about in production. If I care enough to say that I'm going to get paged on it, then I really want to make sure it can't get to production unless it passes that test. And then here's another one. So in every sprint, do one nice thing, OK? So help your responders in each and every sprint. Even if it's not on a card, you rebel, you. So in every sprint or work unit, you want to add value to your responders. Those responders could be you. Especially if they're you, then you really want to do this. But let's pretend they're not, and you're going to be nice. So always find something to do. Like I said, even if it's not on a card, you rebel. So let's talk about some examples of how you can do this. I gave the example before that was a little bit bigger, where maybe your product owner has to be involved, where you're saying, I'm going to really go in, and I'm going to tackle some tough technical debt. So you're going to look at some of these, and they're going to seem obvious to some of you. And if they seem obvious to you, then I ask the question, I assume you've already done them? So first of all, give better context maybe in your logging, your alerting, right? A stack trace is not context. Stack trace is helpful, but give some understanding. If the person has to troubleshoot this, what does it mean? Um, remove some technical debt. Yes, you all have some, OK? Just chip away it a little bit. It's the same thing about getting rid of actual money debt that you have. Nobody expects you to go pay off your $35,000 credit card once you know, in a month. But if you can chip away at it a little bit, now you've got a little bit more you can do. Technical debt can work the same way. Add some useful tests. Just adding tests doesn't help. Um, I, I heard a talk once where uh, Jez Humble gave the example of an organization where they said, one of the ways that we're going to measure uh, the effectiveness of our software engineers is that they need to add, everybody has to add at least one test per sprint. You want to know what those tests look like? There are a lot of assert equals true. OK? So add tests, but you know, useful ones. Don't split hairs. And then also remove something unused. Remember we talked about complexity. We're always adding stuff to our code and to our software. How often do you remove something that isn't used anymore? I mean, it's cool if you're using Go, because it'll pull it out for you. But you know, every other language doesn't do that. So some other ways to add value. It maybe use feature flags. Put some context into the configuration that says, this is what this does. More importantly, this is how to turn it off and when you should turn it off. Um, if you use runbooks, make sure they're up to date every time you cut a release. If you're not able to do this, get rid of the runbook altogether. An incorrect runbook is considered harmful. So if you can't do this, don't have runbooks. You might be getting where I'm going at, which is don't have run books, um, because it's really, really hard to keep them up to date. And then simplify, man. Again, find something within your code, within your project, that you can do a little thing to make it less complex. So uh, I'd love for later for you guys, for you people, you folks, y'all, to uh, share some of your on-call stories with me. I will be around all day today. I'll be around tomorrow morning. You can find me on uh, the Twitters. I'm at Matt Stratton. Uh, my website is my name. I have a podcast called Arrested DevOps, which we'll be recording an episode of right after this in some room upstairs. I'm sure someone will tell you. And uh, I will be putting up a link to these later. So I just want to show you where some of these resources are. You don't need to jot them down, but things. Um, we have a webinar page. This is my one pitch for PagerDuty. It's not even for the product. We have a webinar coming up at the end of this month called Improving Your Employee Retention with Real-Time Ops Data. It's all about that data I talked about earlier. So by the way, you got a sneak peek of that data that no one has seen outside of PagerDuty yet. So that was kind of cool. Um, a blog post I wrote called Page It Forward. Talked a little bit about information flow, the normalization of deviance. Uh, the book Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson. If you haven't read it, it's one of my favorites. It's really good. Uh, we did an episode of Rest DevOps called Disasters, which is about this topic. And I, make, I made references to things like being an incident commander, how you run a call, all of those things. Those are all inspired. Those are all references I made to the internal process that we use for incident response at PagerDuty. We have open sourced that. So if you go to response.pagerduty.com, you can see, number one, how we do that. Take it for what it is. It's what works for us. But we also accept pull requests, so if you have ways to improve it. 
So thank you very much for your time.